Hello everyone, good morning. My name is Rachit Arora and today I'm going to talk on topic storage requirements for running Spark workloads on Kubernetes. So before I start, I just need some show of hands, like how many of you are familiar with Spark or running jobs on Spark? 80% of you. So I'll skip some introductory part. <laughs> And how many of you are familiar with Kubernetes, running workloads on Kubernetes in production? OK. And how many of you have tried running Spark on Kubernetes? OK. So before I begin, just a small introduction about myself. I'm a lead software engineer at IBM Software Labs in Bangalore. Uh, we have two teams which we I am part of. One is like. Uh, analytics engine team, which gives uh, managed service offering for running Spark or Hadoop clusters as a service on IBM Cloud. We provide SDP as a service to our end users, and we are already running as a containerized version of SDP on IBM Cloud. Uh, you can go on IBM Cloud and provision SDP. Uh, and there's another part of service which I'm leading is, we call it as Hummingbird service or Spark environments, uh, which is uh, like Spark only clusters, uh, which comes in few seconds. So I'm a regular conference traveler. Uh, I see a lot of familiar faces from last time, uh, which I met in Berlin. And this time it's like different that I'm traveling with my wife to uh, Barcelona. I've traveled all this week, entire of Barcelona. I uh, had tapas and long drinks or last members. So if you have some food options which you want me to try tonight, please let me know. <laughs> that will be really nice. So I'm also writing a book. Uh, it's on algorithms on big data. So yeah, I'm, I'm writing with some professors, which there's an attempt to make uh, it easy for uh, college students, undergraduate students, postgraduate students to learn about big data and have like a planned way of learning big data. So a quick introduction to Spark, those who are not familiar with Spark. So Spark is an open source, uh, uh, in massively in-memory uh, in tool, uh, and you can think as a, an execution engine for running your analytical workloads. Think of Spark as an in-memory layer which sits on top of your uh, data sources. It gathers all the data and uh, do operations in memory. It has, at the core of the Spark, it has a lot of uh, uh, libraries or algorithms to do the scheduling operations, do the I.O. operations, and it comes with hundreds and hundreds of operators uh, which will help you do uh, machine learning, which will help you do uh, graph processing. Uh, it also has the SQL and the streaming analytics options. You can build your application in Spark in choice of your language like Java uh, or Python, Scala, R. And Spark can run on uh, like enterprise grad uh, resource manager or a cluster manager like Yarn. It can run on Mesos. It can also run in a standalone scheduler or on cloud. It can even run on your laptops or using your standalone scheduler. Or you can choose to run Spark on Kubernetes. Right. So when we need to have a big data application, this is a typical big data application pipeline. Like you'll start with your ingestion of data, which will come from various sources. It could be coming from your laptops or your traditional warehouses, or it could be coming from your some streaming uh, uh, sources. Uh, then uh, you may have the right set of data, but it may not be in the right format. You need to uh, like understand your data, evaluate what all columns are high there. You need to do null handling. Uh, so you need to prepare your data so that it's ready for analytics. So that's the job of a data engineer to do the data preparation part. And then comes the role of a data scientist uh, who uh, basically is responsible for building your analytical models, use the data prepared by your data engineers, and uh, come use tools like machine learning algorithms to come up with models. And then uh, there is an application developer who will uh, use the analytical models prepared 
for building some chatbots or some other cognitive applications for getting more insights from your data. So this is in line with what CDP is going to offer in like five experiences they are going to offer. So you can have your one of your experiences for one any part of your uh, big data pipeline. So let's drill down into more shoes of a data scientist more and understand as a data scientist what a data scientist is really looking for. So as a data scientist, I want to do uh, like social media analytics, text media, text analytics. I want to run Spark jobs. I want to run uh, uh, Ask programs. I want to uh, see the performance of my Spark jobs and improve them further. Right, and I want to uh, see some daemon logs. I want to basically run Jupyter notebooks for uh, building those models. And if I am a data scientist and I have to do that today or using some on-prem system, what I, what I have to do as a data scientist? So first, if I'm doing it on an on-prem kind of a thing, I would need to uh, acquire right set of hardware for right set of use case. Right? And then prepare that hardware so that it's ready for uh, installation. By preparation, you will need to uh, do uh, like partitioning of the disk, setup of the network. Uh, then you will also need to install some prereqs, and then try installing Spark. If you're lucky, if you have done proper configuration right, you may get at it in the first time. But you will see that most of the time, it will fail. It can fail either for some wrong configuration or some hardware issues, which you will need to fix and try again. Right? And with multiple such attempts, you will be able to have it running. But then there is a problem of maintaining it. Right? You need to apply security patches. You need to uh, upgrade to the latest version. So uh, there's a lot of activities which you need to do if you are managing uh, Spark or Hadoop on-prem on your own. Right? With the increase of uh, your analytical workloads or demand, you will think of using some virtualized solution, which can help you do this repeatedly. You may use uh, something like CloudBrick to have it installed on your on-prem system, which will do it repeatedly. But there also, you will need to uh, think it of, of problems like having uh, maintaining high availability for yourself, uh, having patching requirement. right? Then you may think of going to some of the cloud providers, which will give you a uh, managed cluster as an offering. Like you could go to Amazon EMR, you could go to Microsoft SD Insights, you could go to IBM Cloud Analytics Engine, and now CDP is also coming with a similar model where you will get cluster on demand. That cluster comes in few minutes. So that minutes is a bracket, like it could vary from uh, four minutes to 15 to 20 minutes. Uh, based on because they have to acquire hardware on their side. And there the problem is, major problem is that you, will, uh, you are paying for the resources even if you are not using it full time. As a data scientist, I'm more interested running my notebooks, right? Which I'm looking for a, a runtime which can come quickly, right? So I'm looking for a, some serverless kind of a model where I can run analytics on demand, and that comes in a few seconds. So in IBM, uh, we are providing this. It's uh, called as Watson Studio Environment, right? Uh, which runs on Kubernetes, and it comes in a few seconds. And for running those environments, you have option of choosing either pure Python environment, or pure R environment, or running uh, Python on Spark, or R on Spark, or Scala on Spark. Right? And you can have option of choosing the number of executors you need, and it comes in a few seconds. Let me just give you a brief uh, demo how it looks like. Right? So this looks like something like this. So it's an attempt to give you an ID kind of feeling so that you can manage your data assets, your notebooks. Uh, uh, and you will have a notebook like this, right? which will be uh, like some, doing some car prediction. So I have this notebook, which I want to run against uh, some runtime like Spark. And 
All I do is once I have this notebook, which can do uh, car prediction for me, all I have to do is that just run it on uh, Watson Studio Spark environments, so which will create a notebook server first, and then it will ask for a Spark cluster in the background, which will have full flash dedicated cluster for you, which will come in few seconds, and you are ready to run your workloads. So uh, in the background, we are setting up some volume options for you. Uh, we are creating volumes for you, which will be required for your Spark cluster. We are also uh, uh, creating an actual Spark cluster on Kubernetes. Uh, so currently, we are running uh, Spark in a standalone mode. But there is an option of running using Spark uh, on the uh, Kubernetes directly more natively. So it has taken this much time for a Spark cluster to be created and ready for this notebook to be uh, run. So what really Kubernetes brings in? So when we are running Spark on Kubernetes, what really Kubernetes is bringing in? So Kubernetes is an uh, open source, portable, extensible uh, platform for running containerized workloads. So Kubernetes takes care of lifecycle of containers. It takes care of high availability of containers. It takes care of uh, 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 like having the logging requirements, monitoring requirements, and we can integrate very well with most of the tools which are provided in Kubernetes. Uh, it gives me option of kind of resources I want, kind of persistence I am looking for, and uh, it really helps me reduce the operational cost by sharing my workload with other uh, analytical workloads I have. So why you should be looking for running Spark on Kubernetes, uh, I have a full-fledged blog which you can go and read. Uh, main idea is that if you have most of your uh, analytical pipeline already containerized, and you are leveraging Kubernetes for that, you may want to run Spark also on Kubernetes, uh, which will help you reduce your operational cost. And you can have a single system for your entire data pipeline. You can leverage the uh, components of uh, like components like Istio, which gives you load balancing capabilities, which gives you capabilities like A-B testing you want to do, uh, which is very well integrated with Kubernetes. Uh, and there is a huge support from Kubernetes community. If you are running into any issues for your any kind of Kubernetes application, you can um, reach out to community and you will get help very soon. So when you want to run Spark on Kubernetes, you have some options. Uh, you can choose to run Spark on Kubernetes on a, as a standalone scheduler running on Kubernetes. With that, you will get a Spark master pod. You will get some Spark workers, uh, and which will be running on Kubernetes. And there will be some volumes which will be mounted on Spark masters and Spark worker, and uh, basically to share data between driver and your executors. And there will, will be some pods running for Jupyter Gateway, which will be your interface for your two notebooks to connect to the Spark cluster. Uh, then you will also have some pods running for History Server, which will be used for viewing your History Server events. Uh, again, sharing some uh, volume mount between your actual Spark cluster or your persistent volume mount between the History Server pod. You can also choose to run. Um, Spark on as, as a natively uh, scheduler, Spark, Kubernetes as a scheduler. So there, you will not have a Spark master running. Uh, so you'll save resources of running Spark master if you want to uh, run Spark on uh, Kubernetes as a scheduler. So there, you have option of doing a Spark submit, the way you do Spark submit to your Spark cluster and point your uh, master as a Kubernetes master. And that will create driver pods and executor pods for you. You can choo uh, choose to have your own image, which will have some uh, your code in it. And uh, then you can run using Spark uh, Kubernetes as a scheduler. There is also an option of running Spark on Yarn, which is running on Kubernetes. Uh, that is really uh, like a redundant option because Yarn is uh, like a container. Uh, it will ask Kubernetes for the container, and then it will give it to Spark. 
right? So, but Yarn is a very good production-ready scheduler, which helps in uh, taking care of all the uh, your container requirements for Spark. And uh, but problem with running Yarn on Kubernetes is that Yarn will run its own JVM in the container, which will be like adding some more uh, memory footprint to your pods, which we, you, you want to run in Kubernetes. So when you are running your Spark application on Kubernetes, there are a lot of storage requirements which you need to tackle. Uh, first one being uh, you need a distributed file system. So you really don't need a distributed file system for many of the Spark applications, but there are some Spark application where you need distributed file systems, uh, something like when you are doing model.save or model.load in Spark, uh, it assumes that there is a distributed file system with running with Spark. So, uh, and if you want to share uh, your data between driver and executors, you will need a distributed file system, right? Then you will need um, some file system for your local scratch space. So this local scratch space is for your input uh, or uh, map output files, your uh, spilled over RDDs on disk. So you need to make sure that this particular file system is really fast, right? And it's like uh, on local disk. Then you will need uh, some uh, storage for your user libraries. So by user libraries, what I mean is that you'll need some either Conda packages if you're running on Python. Like Conda comes with like 6 GB footprint, so you need some storage. Uh, if you are using Conda 2 or Conda 3, uh, if you have your own Python packages which you want in your Spark application, so you need some storage for that. If you have some jars like which you want in your class path, right? So you need some storage for managing the user libraries. So you also need to think about having some storage for logs, like where the logs will be persisted, or are they going to be only transient for running a just only Spark application? So you need to design for uh, having a storage strategy for your logs. Similarly, for history server events, if you are running Spark uh, like uh, in a serverless model, you may want to persist your history server events so that you can uh, later go and uh, uh, run history server against them to see how your application behaved on a, some certain period of time. Then you'll have, uh, like you want to do uh, some uh, templates, create templates for your configurations, and you may, don't know, you may not want to pass configuration on each job which you are running. You may want to store your configurations in a template format, right, so that you can reuse whenever you, you are running some same kind of jobs. So you may need some storage to store those configurations or Spark ENVs uh, in some format. Then you will have some... Uh, storage requirement for storing your credentials in a safe way uh, so that they are not visible for admins or, uh, or you want to control access to those credentials. And finally, you obviously need some persistent store where you will be reading your data your, uh, and uh, story, uh, storing your data after you are done with your analytical workload. So when you need to decide on some storage which you are going to use for any of these requirements, you'll need to think of size, like how much storage I need for each of those uh, uh, requirements I have. You need to think of uh, speed and high ops, like how, how fast access I need. You may have separate, uh, different uh, requirement for, let's say when you are using um, logs, you need more write efficient storage when you are using it for your user libraries, you need more read efficient storage, right? And you need to decide whether the storage is going to be persistent or transient, like when are you going to store your artifacts for long time, or you are going to uh, let them go once the Spark application is uh, over. Then uh, this is very important if you are working in an enterprise kind of his, uh, workload. You want, once your Spark application is deleted, you want to safely delete all the artifacts which were running on Kubernetes so that it cannot be retrieved back, 
right? RM minus RF is not a safe delete. Uh, you need to do a lot many stuff like disk scrubbing to uh, do a safe delete to totally erase your data. So you need to take care of these characteristics when you are choosing your storage also. So you need to take care of isolation. Let's say you are using some distributed file system, and there are multiple folders in distributed file system. You don't want uh, that folder to be accessible by all your teams in your organization. You may want to have authorization rules in place so that it is accessible by, let's say, data scientists only and not by data engineers. And obviously, you will also need to consider price. Like There are many good storage options, but they are very, very costly to use. So that is also one of the considerations when you are deciding on what storage you need to do. So this, is, this uh, uh, characteristics comes into play when you need uh, run times very, very fast. Right? There are some storage options which takes minutes to be provisioned and then made available. But you will, uh, if you have requirements of getting Spark uh, run times in seconds, so this characteristics of provisioning time, the time it takes for the, it, to, that storage to be available is very critical. Obviously, uh, you also want the storage to be scalable. So the, we are in a model now where compute is separate and storage is separate. You want your storage to be scalable uh, so that you, uh, uh, you can scale on demand with your increased workloads of your analytics. You also want access control so that for auditing purposes, like who accessed your storage when and how long it uh, was accessed for. So all those details are important uh, for you to uh, decide which storage to use. You also want your storage to be pluggable so that if there is a better option available, uh, let's say for a few months from now, so you can switch over to that kind of storage rather than continue using your storage without changing your Spark application. You'll also uh, want uh, your storage to be infrastructure agnostic. Many of the cloud providers has many options available for you, uh, but they are like you will uh, very proprietary to them. Uh, like Amazon has their own storage options, uh, uh, Microsoft has their own storage options, but you may want to avoid them if you don't want to have cloud lock-in, right? So considering those characteristics, uh, Kubernetes by default provide many of the uh, volume uh, options for you. Uh, so these are provided by default. Uh, by Kubernetes community and supported by the Kubernetes community. And they have stopped adding new ones to this list. And they, have, uh, they want to, if you have new uh, requirements, you, they pro support something called as uh, pl volume plugins using flex drivers or uh, container storage integration, CSI plugins. Uh, so you can create your own drivers. Uh, some of the noteworthy are, which are very widely used are uh, this cluster FS, host path, local, uh, so you, you can choose. So if you have, if that your volume requirement is not fitting out of that list, you can have uh, your own volume plugin created using one of these two options, using Flex Volume, which enable users to write their own drivers and support uh, their volumes in Kubernetes. Uh, but uh, vendors need to install the volume plugin on certain path of your Kubernetes worker node. So that's one uh, thing you need to uh, take care of when you are using Flex volumes, that you need to install them on your Kubernetes worker nodes. So there's an option of using container storage interface, uh, which is a standard way of uh, uh, any block or file storage, uh, and uh, it Basically, you don't need to touch any component of Kubernetes to have uh, your driver coded if you're using CSI for writing your own driver. So um, there's also an option if you have your storage slightly remote, like if you have a HDFS, if you have a DBFS, Hive running, you can configure Spark to use that. It's via Spark configuration. So you can choose to uh, use object storage, Hive, or even Kudu in Spark if you want to access via Spark configurations and not natively via Kubernetes uh, drivers. So now let's explore some of the 
options we can have for various storage requirements we discussed, like um, what are the options we have if we want to use some uh, volume for distributed file system in Kubernetes, right? So uh, first one is like we are discussing for the distributed file system. We have the option of using NFS, right? You can have your network file server running in your infrastructure on or cloud, have a, and you can create something called as persistent volume, uh, which will you will give details where is your NFS server, and then you can ask for persistent volume claims on top of it and use it for your distributed file system. Right? It will get mounted on pods, and uh, you can access directly uh, uh, from your pods this uh, particular NFS. Then you can also choose to have HDFS or DBFS. So DBFS is the S3-based uh, Databricks file system, uh, which is very, very efficient for, uh, having, uh, for this particular storage requirement. You can also try to use something uh, which Portworx offer. So the good, uh, good part of this option is that it comes by default with encryption option, right? So you can create persistent volume claims using Portworx, which gives you very good uh, uh, encryption options if you are looking for, for your distributed file system requirements. <laughs> Uh, very widely used option in uh, dev scenarios is uh, ClusterFS, right? So ClusterFS can be set up on your own Kubernetes cluster, so it will run its own containers or pods on the Kubernetes cluster workers, or you can choose to have a separate infrastructure for ClusterFS, and you can create your persistent volume claims for using ClusterFS. But in our uh, experiments, we saw that when we are running hundreds and hundreds of Spark application, uh, ClusterFS start to slow down, and it used to take more time for uh, volume claim to be ready to be used in pod. So we have seen that there was a delay of around 90, to 90 seconds for a ClusterFS volume to be made available, because it's running on the same infrastructure where your Spark is running. There's a very good option of using Alexio for your distributed file system. So Alexio is an open source virtualized uh, parallel file system, uh, which basically it's formally known as Tycon. Uh, it enables any application to interact with any data of any storage in, at memory speed. So we are evaluating Alexio for our cloud offering, and we have very good uh, results of using Alexio. So for uh, local scratch space, uh, you want very fast uh, access. So uh, based on your cloud provider, you can have a Kubernetes cluster running with SSD disks on your worker nodes, which can be used for uh, local scratch space. Uh, so you can choose SATA disks also, depending upon your uh, requirements. Uh, one very good option of using uh, here is that uh, there's a uh, volume type MTDIR, which can be run using your local file system. So with MTDIR, uh, it, its uh, uh, life is still the life of a pod. So when a pod comes into existence, this volume MTDIR is created. It doesn't, and when the uh, pod dies down, uh, the volume contents also are removed by Kubernetes itself. So instead of using a host path option on your SSD or uh, SATA disk, you can use MTDIR option for uh, local scratch disks. So what all you need to do is this is a YML I have shown, like to access that as MTDIR uh, in your uh, when you want to use this volume for your scratch space. So for logs, you need to actually think a little differently. You should not store logs on some host path or MTDIR. Uh, you can think of uh, sending your logs to some logging service if you're running on cloud, right? All the cloud providers provide you some logging service where you can send it to your um, uh, Kibana and uh, for your further log analytics. So to do that, you can run something called as a sidecar containers, like a Fluentd is a very good option for running uh, as a sidecar container for which you can have a shared amount created with your, let's say, uh, driver logs, executor logs, and Fluentd will push those logs to some logging service, and which you can use for uh, future analytics. So for user libraries, uh, 
it's a very debatable uh, logging options. Like uh, what I personally recommend or personally want to use is Docker image itself as a volume, right? Which is not natively supported in Kubernetes, uh, but there are uh, flex volume drivers available which you can mount Docker image, which has your libraries already. Uh, like your Python packages or even the Conda uh, packages you need, jars you need, mount them on your uh, pods and on a location which is already there in your class path so that your packages are available for your Spark application. So that is one very good option we have when we want to use user libraries uh, 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 in your Spark application. Or you can choose to run uh, like directly from a Git repo Kubernetes support that. You can create a persistent volume claim directly from a Git repo, which has your uh, all the libraries already in there. Or you can do something like uh, run a daemon set on your Kubernetes worker nodes, uh, which will bring your libraries from anywhere you want when a node, a Kubernetes worker node comes up. And it will store it in uh, some host path of the worker. right? And you can mount that host path from your uh, pods. So your libraries will be av made available. That gives you, if you are looking for a very fast read access, so you can uh, store it in your SSDs using uh, daemon set or any other mechanism and read it uh, from directly from the host path. So for configurations, like um, you want to templatize your configurations and you don't want to pass your configurations to each Spark job, so you can create something called as a config map, which is like you can have it in a file, key value pairs, or you can directly have it your key value pairs defined in your config map, and have a YML for your config map created. And that will basically mount uh, as, a, as a volume on the Kubernetes pod, and it will be accessible on your uh, Kubernetes pod. So you can have your config map for your Spark ENV file, Right, which have your all your configurations, and it, you can mount it uh, on your pods. For passwords, uh, so you want to store your credentials for accessing your data stores, and you don't want to be uh, made it uh, like write it in plain text. You don't want to push the, your passwords in your images because your images can be accessed by multiple people. So uh, you should store your passwords in a uh, Kubernetes resource called as Kubernetes Secrets. So right, it encodes your credentials, and it will not be uh, visible for your admins of your Kubernetes cluster. It, it gets mounted again uh, in your pod, and it's available for your Spark application to access them. But you can have your role-based access controls written such a way that your admins don't uh, get to read those parts passwords. So you need to use Kubernetes secrets for storing your credentials. So for persistent store, where you are actually reading terabytes and terabytes of data in your Spark workloads and uh, sending it back, for those kind of workloads, you uh, uh, may not want to mount that as a POSIX file system. Uh, we recommend you using something as a Strokator libraries, which uh, you can configure in your Spark application, like where is your S3 location, where is your cost location, where is your HDFS location. You configure Spark. S3 Strokator libraries are very well optimized for read and write operations and use them for your persistence data. So uh, what are the things which we are working with community to help uh, get some help and improve? Uh, so I was working with uh, on this particular Git issue of Kubernetes to have image as uh, one of the inbuilt volume support. But that has been a long running issue. Like from 2014, it is open, but still going on. So we have the option of using volume drivers, uh, a volu flex volume drivers for mounting images as a mount. But uh, that's not something which is like very widely supported. You, uh, you have to create your own volume drivers and uh, manage it on your own. Um, so we are also working with Portworx to have 
um, better encrypted volume support uh, available for your all your data encryption needs. Um, we are also uh, looking for an option that uh, many of the cloud providers and by default in Kubernetes that for a persistent volume and a persistent volume claim, there is one-to-one -one mapping. There are scenarios that uh, where we need uh, one persistent volume to be accessed by multiple volume claims. So that's some uh, idea which we are exploring if it is possible and feasible to do that. Um, and then we are also looking for uh, some uh, shared file system which has faster uh, uh, access so that we don't need to rely on SSD disks or local host paths for our scratch space needs. We can use some shared file system for scratch space itself. Uh, we are also looking for an option that for a given pod or a given Spark application, how we can um, um, like limit the network access it will do on a each pod level so that one pod is not consuming all the resources of your network, and we can um, configure a pod to go till a certain band, lift, band limit and use such so many uh, network resources. Uh, so there are, we can control pod for like memory and CPU resources, but we are looking for options like we, if we can control a pod for network resources also. So we are also looking for uh, some uh, volume options which can handle the safe delete uh, if you are concerned for ISO requir uh, certification requirements for HIPAA requirements. So you need to have safe delete implemented by your own. Uh, but we are looking for any uh, either volume plugin or by Kubernetes itself which provides us uh, safe delete options. So we are uh, uh, if you are running a Spark directly on uh, using Kubernetes as a native uh, scheduler, uh, there is option of using Spark application controller, right? Which is very recently added by Google. So it gives you a YML way of submitting your Spark application. You can create your Spark operator, and then you can create your Spark application. So we are looking a way how we can integrate our volume options in that. Uh, uh, if you want to uh, uh, make use of Spark application controller for submitting your workloads to uh, natively Spark running and using Kubernetes as a scheduler. So that's all I have. Uh, here are some references. If you want to try Watson Studio, uh, which gives you uh, bring all your data requirements in one place, like all your data management, data policies, data preparation, and your uh, analytical in a common framework. Right? You can index, discover, control, share uh, your data, and you can refine your data using data refinery flows. Uh, and you can do various operations using Watson Studio uh, Spark environments. And you can also try uh, using IBM Watson Analytical Engine, which gives you a managed cloud offering. Thank you. We have two, three minutes for questions. Uh, yeah. yeah uh, you mentioned that for logs, you use a sidecar. Yeah. Uh, could we also allow Kubernetes to log? Yeah, many of, uh, if you're using uh, any cloud provider, they provide you these sidecars by default. You just need to configure them to send your application logs also to some of the uh, logging service they are already integrated. All the cloud providers have this option, and they most of them run FluentD as sidecar for sending these log. Uh, Why not use a daemon set versus a sidecar? So daemon set is like um, it uh, comes when a node, new node is added, right? And it comes into action if there is a restart of a pod or if there is a uh, some. It needs a trigger even to be become active and do it. Whereas FluentD is always watching for your log files. And you have a lot of configuration which you can configure FluentD. Like you want to push 100 MB of log chunks, or you want to push smaller log chunks, or you want to push at certain interval of time. Uh, that configuration support is there in FluentD already. That is missing in daemon set. Any other question? Yeah. 
Yeah, so I have not mentioned Chef here, <laughs> uh, but yes, uh, Chef is one of the options uh, there. But problem with Chef when I uh, prototyped was that it took longer for a pod to become ready. Uh, what timeline which we are looking for is milliseconds. So it took around seven to eight seconds for uh, to be mounted on a pod. So and, uh, Rook IO. yeah, same same experience for uh, Rook. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for coming.